Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the seventh in our series of live CLAG webinars. Uh, my name is Jim Biles, and I am delighted that you are here with us today. Um, I'd like to welcome you as well as our five panelists and um, our organizer and moderator. Today's session focuses on decolonizing knowledge production and dissemination in Latin America. And indeed, we have renamed this special session of Live CLAG, Live JLAG, because the session was organized by Johnny Finn, who is the editor of the Journal of Latin American Geography. And Johnny has brought together a very diverse um, group of people as panelists here who are going to be speaking about um, this topic. As always, um, there is uh, room and time allotted for questions, answers, discussion, and follow-up. So please make use of the Q&A box that you can find at the bottom of the screen. Uh, if you have any other comments or questions, you can put them in the chat. Um, what I would like to do now is to turn things over to Johnny Finn, uh, who will be our moderator and I will step back. So Johnny, welcome and welcome to our panelists. Hey everybody, thanks Jim for the, the kind introduction. And I'm, I'm really happy to see so many people here on the call. Um, shortly, I'll be introducing the, the panel that we've put together, that we've assembled to kind of discuss these issues surrounding decolonization of knowledge production and dissemination in Latin America. But I do wanna make just a couple of kind of preliminary notes before I introduce the panels and kind of explain how, how we're going to, to roll uh, this evening. Um, first, I wanna point, uh, as, as Jim said, I, I'm the editor of the Journal of Latin American Geography. We have a huge and really, really hardworking editorial team. Um, one of them is on uh, the panel tonight, uh, Gabriela Valdivia is one of our associate editors. And I do wanna point uh, your attention to um, the, our recent issues of the journal. Our current issue is the last issue of last year, um, volume 19, number four, and be on the lookout. Uh, the next issue, the first issue of 2021, will be out next week uh, via Project Muse. And if you're a subscriber to the journal, uh, it will land in your mailbox sometime after that. So do be on the lookout uh, for that uh, and access it. It does include several articles that are uh, open access, which I'll talk about in just a second. The other thing, and, and I know we're here uh, for live TLAG and live JLAG, I do want to mention that next week, next Saturday, April 10th, um, during the virtual AAG meeting, uh, the JLAG lecture, this is an annual lecture that the journal organizes. Uh, it will be fully virtual, uh, but it will be featuring six members of Heo Brujas, the, the community of feminist geographers from Mexico City, um, who will be doing a session um, uh, with, as a part of the AAG. Unfortunately, I did confirm with the AAG that it will be limited to only registered attendees of the AAG um, virtual meeting, but the recording of it will be publicly available via YouTube shortly thereafter, and I'll be sending around and distributing the information about that. So um, now I do want to return to the panel and to the topics at hand, uh, and I want to introduce, and I'll introduce them individually as they speak shortly, but just as a, a wide introduction, uh, I want to introduce uh, Diana Vela Almeida uh, from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. Diana, thanks so much for being here. Uh, Sofia Saragosin from, uh, from the Universidad San Francisco de Quito and from the, the, collective, the, crit the collective of Critical Geographers of Ecuador. Um, uh, Sofia, thank you also for being here. Um, Liz mason Dees is an independent scholar and translator uh, based in Buenos Aires. Uh, and she, and I'll, I'm going to talk in just a second about the new JLAG section, JLAG en Traducción. And Liz has done uh, most of the translations for, for JLAG for our new um, section on translations. Gabriela Valdivia is uh, an associate editor of uh, JLAG. So Gabriela, thanks for being here. And Renato Emerson dos Santos uh, is joining us from the Universidad Federal do Rio de Janeiro. Uh, Renato, thanks very much uh, for being here. Um, in just a moment, I'm going to turn the floor over to, to these five panelists. I think they each have 
uh, a, just a few minutes of preliminary remarks, some thoughts that they've put together on the topic of decolonizing knowledge production and dissemination in Latin America. And I'm going to I'm going to let them each uh, have have about five or six minutes to kind of give their key, their, their big takeaways and their big ideas, and then we'll open it up for discussion, like Jim said, through the Q&A function uh, here in Zoom. Um, and, and I really, I hope that we can, I mean, all of these, all of these um, panelists, I'm sure have really important ideas to share, but I do hope that we can kind of start to think through, like, what does it mean to decolonize knowledge production knowledge, disse dissemination of knowledge in Latin America. What does it mean in theory? What does it mean in practice? What does it actually take? What does it require us as scholars in and of Latin America? What does it actually take that we do? Um, from my perspective, individually, I'm particularly interested in what the, what the publishing kind of, the, 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 the publishing uh, push can do, but also what JLAG in particular, what we can do and what we're trying to do, uh, which I can talk about a little bit later. Um, let me just say, well, actually, I think that's enough of me. I, and, 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 and I have a couple of slides that we can um, turn around to, uh, come around to later about more about JLAG. But at this point, I really do want to, um, to introduce our first panelist. Um, the, the, our first speaker will be uh, Sofia Saragosin. Uh, so, Sofia, why don't you uh, unmute and, and take it away? Thank you so much for being here. Sure. Um, thank you so much uh, to Johnny and to all the other panelists and everyone that's joining us this afternoon. Um, so first, just a few words on my positionality. I, I think I'll be speaking more towards decolonizing knowledge production and dis dissemination across the hemispheric scale, uh, across the Americas. Um, that's kind of where I'm situating myself in terms of decolonizing knowledge and praxis as kind of uh, um, something that has to occur across the Americans as, and as a hemispheric scale for multiple reasons. Um, one is that, uh, that until now, I mean, most of the decolonial knowledge production in academic journals has occurred in the global north and in English speaking journals. Uh, in conferences, so I think that there, you know, that's that's a kind of like an an uncomfortable premise from which we we start this discussion, um, and the discussions have tended to focus um, have tended to also kind of strengthen the South North binary uh, in that the South uh, would inherently be decolonial and the North would be inherently colonial, um, and I think taking a hemispheric approach is a is a significant way to dismantle. Um, kind of these rigid notions of the North-South binary, but also honor kind of those um, decolonial relational placemaking uh, efforts underway that are, you know, anti-racist, that have a decolonial feminist lens. So part of what I'm going to speak to today is uh, about a hemispheric scale, uh, not just what's happening within Latin America. Um, I think till now, most of the decolonial discussions in critical geography ac across the Americas have focused on three things. A focus on epistemology, has focused on embodiment of territory, and third, kind of the critiques towards the colonial structure of academia. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that those are very relevant discussions, um, but I think that there are some uh, key points that I would like to share uh, with everyone today is kind of, um, that's to kind of provoke certain discussions and see where, where we all see uh, decolonization efforts forward. The first is that I think what's, what's becoming apparent is that there's a need to pluralize colonial analytics, right? Because most of Latin American uh, colonial, decolonial discussions tend to focus on the modernity, coloniality, decoloniality school. Um, and that, while very important, I think a lot of the Brazilian geography um, for knowledge production is focused on that. I think there is a need to kind of pluralize, for example, the, the different possibilities of colonial analytics. So I've written on making the case for settler colonialism also within Latin America and geographies and the possibilities that that brings forth. Also because there's a lot of parallel discussions happening. You have a lot of uh, parallels between Latinx geography in the US and Latin American critical geography, particularly from um, decolonial feminist anti-racist praxis and knowledge production from collectives, um, not just academic production. So I think, you know, understanding that we ha we're having very 
um, you know, very common and very these parallel discussions that are all focusing on decentering kind of the Anglo-centric colonial um, kind of Western frameworks, not just epistemological. I think that's key. Um, and I think you know one of one of my one of my other kind of key points uh, that I've been writing on is the emphasis on method and not just on using using decolonial theory. Um, and, and that's also a critique towards not just focusing on the epistemological um, uh, kind of uh, perspective on, on decolonization, because that, that's tended to kind of dominate it, you know, that's been dominating a lot of the geographical uh, knowledge production, lately, you know, delinking kind of like the Western gaze and, and bringing forth um, some alternate perspectives. So I think that it's not just an issue of epistemology. I think there's a lot that we can do with focusing on method and that our that our geographical knowledge production, the focus be on the process of doing decolonial work, not necessarily that our theory, that the theory that we use has to be decolonial. Um, and that's something that I think has become key to me, uh, particularly um, in the Ecuadorian context where there's a resistance towards the decolonial. It's not always so easily translatable. It's not always so, um, you know, it's not always seen as something that's going to be uh, inherently useful here. I think there's a lot of tension towards the decolonial because there's a very particular um, um, understanding of what the decolonial can be and cannot be. And I think what way we can move forward is understanding the plurality of colonial analytics, but also decolonial possibilities. The other is, you know, what I've started my talk with the hemispheric gaze um, and how we think about the transnational or transnational transnationalism without honoring the nation state. Um, and I think that uh, is becoming uh, particularly important in parallel discussions that I see on relational anti-racist placemaking, um, Cimarronaje or Maroon uh, territories, um, uh, the land body, cuerpo territorio, commonalities that are occurring that are very similar discussions, again, focused on embodiment of territory, but also with regards to anti-racist placemaking. So I, I you know, I've I'm really, um, you know, emphasizing the hemispheric gaze because of these parallel discussions. Um, and then just two last points are, you know, that I would like to leave um, kind of for, for, for larger uh, discussion is one is a further need to decolonize intersectionality. Um, and also I think in that that's more of a critique towards what's happening within Latin America where we're using intersectionality kind of just as a, a band-aid phrase um, also within geography and there is a need to you know be uncomfortable with a particular type of structural oppression right because now we're everyone's now in, in Ecuadorian context is now is, is coming into a lot of the anti-racist discussion and um, collective organizing but there's a need to be very uncomfortable with particular types of oppression without just kind of putting the intersectional focus as a, as a band-aid term. Um, and the last, I think, and, and this is, you know, this is influenced by Michelle Daggle's work, um, but also by, um, you know, different uh, feminist collectives in Ecuador is, you know, discomfort as a radical accountability practice. Like, you know, they, they need to keep being uh, uh, uncomfortable uh, and creating uncomfortable discussions. And one, one discussion that for me has been particularly important in the past months and um, along with, you know, Maggie Ramirez, uh, and Alex Garcia uh, has been the discussion between Latinx geographies and Latin American critical geography. So uh, with that, I will end and hand it over to the rest of uh, the panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, um, Sophia. And I encourage folks to, to put questions and thoughts into the Q&A. And when we loop around to a broader discussion, we'll have, I think we'll have plenty of time to engage with, with what folks on the call are thinking. Um, but let me turn now to Gabriela Valdivia, um, and just the floor is yours, Gabby. Go right ahead. You're muted. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, it's great to follow Sofia here. Um, I think <laughs> I think there's a lot of intersection with uh, what I had planned to say for today. But I think uh, there are ways in which I can underscore some of the things that she has already mentioned. Um, my reflections are structured around what I think are five observations that I see in decolonial knowledge research and pedagogy in and about Latin America. 
And I see these observations as a way to contribute to a conversation. That is, my observations are partial and they're sesgadas, by no means complete. Um, and I want to think about using them as a way to holding space for recognizing and engaging with the plurality of decolonial praxis in academia and outside of academia. Um, I think it's also uh, a, a bit difficult to think through like how we're talking about decolonial praxis when we are doing it all in English. Um, so I hope that Liz can also speak to some of those difficulties that we have in um, cross Cross, uh, crossing our boundaries, our language boundaries. Um, but I want to just say a few caveats before I start, because I think it's important to situate ourselves and, and this is where I am starting from. Um, if I'm talking about research and pedagogy, I need to talk about education and specifically mine, because it informs where my view is coming from. Um, my formal education is steeped in the project of mestizaje in the educational institutions that feed the desire for a universal national subject in Peru and had that have nor that have been nourished by an entroque of blanqueamiento, prosperity, and care for the nation. I cannot start a conversation about the colonization of knowledge without acknowledging that this is where this is where my foundations are. And that my personal life outside of school, but even within school, uh, weaved in and out of this educational mission and project that has been so foundational to my my uh, my training. Um, I'm the daughter of rural migrants who benefited from national handouts and incentives and that feel forever indebted to the Estado Patron. And that I was raised as a post-colonial subject in an environment of what we call an enlightened modernity in suburban Lima. Uh, and I have been disciplined according to a set of heteropatriarchal and mis misogynistic and racist expectations um, that we're all familiar with. Uh, the do well in school, speak multiple European languages, be a good daughter, don't get in trouble, don't shake the boat, don't talk to communists, don't talk to leftists, don't go to dangerous places, go to church, get married, hopefully to a good whiter man and have children. These are all realities that we might think are personal and intimate, but are foundational to how we think, how we act and how we practice and how we connect with each other. So I'm laying them out there as a way to say that I'm not a perfect decolonial scholar. I've never claimed to be, but that these are part of my package. Um, these expectations have generated discomfort and disorientations. But at a young age, it was difficult to make sense of the psychic and emotional rajaduras, huecos, and fissures that these produce. And I use these terms because this is from the work of Gloria Saldua. And when I read her work already as an adult, I found, I finally found I understood some portions of what was being, what I was going through as a Latin American scholar who is now inhabiting the hallways of a US institution. Um, and through, though they have caused disorientation and rebelliousness, I internalized these because those who cared for me said it was the right thing to do. A lot of the internalized colonialism, the in colonial thought that is, becomes part of our habit of thinking has settled itself through love um, and through the care of others. And so this has been an eye-opening experience to turn the analytical lens on myself. And yet I feel that these caveats in education and miseducation orient in how I situate my own thoughts on the colonial knowledge production, which I understand as a destination and, and not as a destination, but as an ongoing process. So I'm going to lay out the five observations and then, um, and then we can go back. If we have a chance to a q and I can deep in on any of these. The first one, and this echoes uh, uh, what Sophia was saying, uh, is that whether we call, whether I call it decolonial, postcolonial, or anti-colonial research and praxis, it is definitely and most certainly feminist, because it is committed to relationships, states of being, and memories that are neglected, invisibilized, devalued, discounted, and silenced in systems of oppression. The second observation is that this kind of scholarship relies on a radical openness 
and a willingness to sit with discomfort. Again, I'm rooting for what Sophia was saying. Um, and there have been many scholars from Kieran Asher and Preeti Ramamurthy, uh, and separately, but also simultaneously, Brenny Mendoza, who are speaking about these different political projects associated with the colonial scholarship and their genealogies. And that sometimes as scholars, we often trip on our own conceptual boundaries and seek to categorize and fix the, the anti or post in critiques of coloniality. Um, my third observation is that methodologically, decolonial scholarship and anti-colonial scholarship and pedagogy engage in an openness to being transformed by research, but also by refusal. Um, refusal in particular, and I think the work of Risha Nagar has been very fundamental for this, is a way in which we enter into those discomforts of unlearning the colonial structures of thought through which we operate. Um, and that they serve um, against what Joyce King has called epistemological annihilation. In her presidential address to the at the 2015 American Educational Research Association annual meeting, King describes annihilation as the way that the school and educational system disappears us, erases us. And she says, to put it simply, annihilation is somnification. And uh, I really appreciate that. And I see it in the works of other scholars, particularly uh, indigenous scholar, uh, Kucha Rislin Baldi, who uses zombies to teach about the experience of colonialism to her students. And she actually talks a lot about what the walking dead in her, in her courses, which is, um, I find a very refreshing way to think through sci-fi um, and pedagogy uh, and decolonial scholarship. Uh, in Latin America, I think uh, the works of Gloria Saldua, for example, echo some of that with the pensamiento fronterizo and the dismemberment of bodies. And I have a, um, I have a slide that I want to show you. Um, let's see if I can share that. But um, also the work of um, um, Le uh, Sochi Leva Solano and Shannon Speed on collaborating. Um, the world traveling that Maria Lugones talks about, and also Sofia and uh, Maria Caleta's uh, work on Cuerpo Territorio also, I find, falls within this space of, of um, questioning the zombification of colonialism. Uh, Monica Moreno Figueroa also in Mexico talks about uh, the affective work of El Asco Hacia Lo Negro as a structure of feeling for which, through which to destructure these notions of racial and political order in Mexico. Um, and she analyzes them through this idea of the distributed intensities of, of, uh, of how racism is lived. My fourth observation is that anti-colonial research is both materialist and is material and situated. Um, it is not a view from above. It should not be about this abstracted sort of framing of anti-colonial or decolonial approaches, but is centered on the fleshness of experiences and their historical weight. Specifically, specifically, I think it engages a serious and intentional engagement with critical theory and gender, sexuality, and race studies. And here I think of the work of Francoise Vergès, as well as the work of Charlene Mollet um, on, on uh, blackness and gender in the Americas. Um, my fifth observation is um, that anti-colonial processes and scholarships are necessarily specu speculative. They are not about inclusion in the current world order, but they are about declaring the end of the existing one and imagine the, imagine the possibility of different kinds of worlds that have not been lived yet. So what does it mean for knowledge production and pedagogy and for a conversation like the one that we're having? Well, um, I don't have an answer. Um, I hope that this is the opening of a conversation. And my goal has been to outline a set of propositions or orientations for how to hold space for this kind of conversation that as Sophia mentioned, is difficult, discomforting, um, and can leave us with more questions than what we started with. But the one that I do want to ask for ourselves, for our panel and for our, our whoever is here now, is um, how does asking these questions change our practices or the work of our research? And um, I am going to share with you the two slides that I have. Um, these are things that I have used in my own teaching as a way to think through the colonial habits of thought um, and that we are embedded with. 
we embed it in. Um, so I think you should be able to see this. Um, this is something from um, drawings of uh, Gloria Saldua. I used this in my in my global environmental justice classes, where we think about the zombification of subjects, the breaking apart the pieces of our bodies, and the the bridges and um, through which we cross to uh, across worlds. And the second one that I really enjoyed using is the work of. Um, Oh my gosh, why am I blanking on her name? Lydia Clark. Uh, and um, she has this exhibit and we actually performed this in our class where I asked students to use a piece of paper and use the scissors to cut their way through the paper. And the exercise is performed in two ways. The first one is you make a straight cut throughout, uh, throughout the piece of paper that's taped together. And the second one is you make a meandering cut that goes transversally, not necessarily following a uh, straight line um, and then we see the different outputs that these works have produced and we tend to have very lively conversations about the process, the performance of this work and how our habit of thought is to continue cutting across a straight line uh, versus the final product that comes out of at least two different performances. So um, I'm going to stop there and uh, thank you. Thank you, Gabby. Um, that's, that's, thank you for that very much. Um, again, I'll, I'll, we'll hold questions and discussion to the end so we can give our speakers a chance to, um, to express their thoughts. And I want to go next to Diana Vela Almeida, who's joining us from, from, from very far from here. Um, we really appreciate you coming, tuning in from Norway. So why don't you go ahead and, and take the floor, Diana? Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. And also, thank you so much for the invitation and all the organizers, as well. Such a pleasure to be with all the panelists today. Um, so I really appreciate what uh, Gavi and Sophie have told, because my approach now to the talk is a little bit different, but I think it is very complementary with what they have already said. So I think um, I, I'm looking for a, for a very fruitful uh, discussion. So I guess I can start also with my own positionality on from what I'm talking about. Um, and a little bit of what I'm talking about is coming from the experience that I had had uh, working as a lecturer in Ecuador in two public universities there. And now seeing the difference uh, on, on the work, on the type of work and the experiences that I've been having now as a postdoctor in a university in, in Norway, which of course, I mean, Norway, it's a very specific, like it has these uh, specificities of itself. So, um, but they reflect on the material differences that I've been uh, able to witness on my own. So I, because of brevity, I'll focus on two main points in this discussion that relate to what I think are some uneven forms of power relationships in that I also think get easily normalized in the production of knowledge between Latin America, but I think it could be any country in the global south and the global north, which is money and time. I'll be talking about that. Um, and I think they are key to be discussing because decolonizing geographies raise also concern, not only on the epistemological practices and forms of knowledges, but also on the material relations that are are in, in the way of conducting research. So as I said, first I'll talk about how the North to South funding is defining also research agendas. And for that, I think budgeting of international grant proposals is very problematic. Even among critical academics uh, that are deeply sensitive to social justice, who can, get, who can set agendas to work with local partners, let's say, or they have defined grounded methodologies, but I think they are still defined in the main research agendas. So as academics Melanie Pineda and Carmen Leon published last year an article that I'm quoting, they said, researchers in the global north usually lead in the proposal stage, while certain partners are only invited to join. The academics in the global north are the ones leading the writing of publication and speaking for the ones in the global south. This is more problematic because the Northern institutions usually select partners who are well known in the field, researchers who speak good English or have studied in Western universities 
or how the network storage. And pretty much that has happened uh, to me uh, here. Um, that is pretty much what I've witnessed so far uh, on writing proposals uh, being in Norway with uh, European funding. And the second point that I want to talk about is the time and location to conduct research and institutional support for it. And I'll be talking uh, from the perspective of uh, what is going on in Ecuador. Because I personally think that the quality of the research is highly influenced by the amount of time dedicated to it. So in most universities in Latin America, people cannot afford to have a full-time master experience, which is around more or less the time when you start to produce knowledge. In Ecuador, for example, master's students are generally in late to start their, their programs. They are already adults in their late 20s or early 30s that probably have children and also have probably full-time jobs to support their households. That means that they can only afford an average between two to three hours to their studies. And that, including, that includes attending to lectures, reading, working on projects, meeting colleagues, et cetera. So I think that seriously limits their capacity to engage in sustained work starting from the master program. The ones that are able to study abroad are the ones who can afford to have the full-time academic experience, and myself included, but are also the ones that have the class-based opportunities to do that, and later will be the ones who can develop the networks with the NORD who can maintain this research quality. So not only that, but I think in decolonizing knowledge, we are not thinking enough of the role of neoliberalism and how neoliberalism has produced knowledge, has also contributed to produce knowledge particular in, a, in particularly ways. So I, I want to note this especially on the violent austerity measures that are happening in many Latin American countries. Again, on, on the case of Ecuador, for example, the government of Moreno last year reduced the budget around 100 million US dollar from the public budget for universities. And I'm only talking about public universities. I'm not talking about any scholarly level. Uh, I'm not talking about what is going on in high schools, what is going on in the schools, in primary schools, or any other level, right? 100 million of dollars. And that led to the firing of hundreds of professors and the ones that I that stayed became even having to work in even more precarious conditions. There are a third group of people like myself that became part of what is called the brain leakage group, right? Because we were not able to find any job in the academy in Ecuador. So I would like to ask who is actually, who are the ones who are conducting research under these circumstances? And who are we able to figure or not? Um, I don't want to talk about any other points because I think those are key points. Um, and these and many other things that, that I'm assuming that Liz maybe will talk about that are very problematic, for example, language and translation and publication, I guess Liz will be talking about that. But I think taking into consideration these, I really want to challenge the idea of wide academic exceptionalism in the North. Because in this latitude, I think academics have the funding possibilities, the time, the institutional support, and the language of domination to do what neoliberal, individualistic, and colonial academia is demanding us to do, right, to individually excel. So from there, um, when I'm thinking about decolonizing the production of knowledge, I think it also has to do with things like redistribution of academic practices, budgeting allocation, access to resources and appropriate acknowledgement of the contribution to the production of knowledge. And with that, I'll finish. Thank you. Diana, thank you very much for, for that contribution. I think you bring, bring up some really important points that kind of implicate many, if not all of us in this, in this, in this very discussion that we're having. So thank you for that. Um, I wanna turn now to Renato Emerson dos Santos, uh, welcome, Renato. It's, it's, it's good to see you, and, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Johnny, for inviting me to, to join you in this very exciting uh, meeting and discussion. And uh, that's, I, I, I really have a very good expectation about what, what we can do from, from this uh, 
this discussion, this collective discussion. It was very good to to hear and to listen my colleagues before because, because I think they they pointed a lot of issues that I that helped me and and saved me to to repeat it. But uh, well, I think well my my part in this, this discussion was to, to to point some issues about uh, the, the the role of. Uh, uh, journals and traduction, thinking about dissemination of, uh, of, of knowledge. Well, uh, I think this is a very, very strong challenge that uh, CLAG, uh, uh, the, the LAG group, will uh, try, try to do because, well, uh, journals like, for example, JLAG, for example, are traditionally a, a, a tool to, 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 make, to, to make stronger the, the structural dependence of the, the peripheries, uh, academical peripheries, in the in these geopolitics of knowledge that, that we have. So uh, traditionally, the, the journals are, are instruments to to reproduce the the, the coloniality of, uh, of of knowledge. So 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 to think about how to change this position or how to to overcome or, or to make inverse this, this position is 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 not is not simple. It's not it's not easy. Because well, we have um, this structure of of coloniality and uh, independence. To, to use the term that uh, I like, I like very much the discussion of Ciel Farida Latas, for example, about the the, the dependence of of the peripheries of academic academic knowledge, and, and so we have the dependence in terms of ideas. Uh, we have dependence in, in coloniality in terms of the, the medias. That uh, uh, the knowledge are produced and, and put to, to circulate in books and uh, journals and the technologies of education and issues as well, and uh, and so I think we have the challenge are around two two key points I think two two kinds of action. First, try try to remove barriers that we have to 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 produce and to circulate. As a as the role of of, of a journal, and of course the, the first barrier is 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 the language, <laughs> as you can see in my terrible English. <laughs> now speaking now, uh, and in, in in the second is to try to 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 create ways to stimulate actions, to stimulate people to 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 publish in in this environment that we have nowadays of neoliberalization of university, and uh, in in Brazilian case I don't know the other case but in a in a situation that our daily labor is more and more involved with not just only more classes and uh, and more uh, need to 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 pick up to to look for the the the, the financial conditions but also to of bureaucratic job that that we have uh, colonizing our time of of labor and the time of life of life or our daily life, so it's it's more and more difficult to 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 produce and to make it. Uh, so this, this, this is the only point that I just want to, to to put about my my own condition as a as a, a black scholar in a in a, in a university in the periphery. And so, uh, so I think firstly in terms of barriers, I, I think we have different kinds of barriers to that. The, the journals must to, to, to address in the discussion. Firstly, it was said here the financial barriers, uh, the, the the paid access to, to to knowledge is a is a problem for us. Well, the difference in terms of uh, of our money exchanges and etc. makes this this access some sometimes sometimes very very difficult. The second are the, the linguistic barriers, that is not just only the the difficulties or, or to, to read or, or more more than this to to write and uh, uh, the, the the norms the rules in terms of linguistic uh, uh, of in, in terms of uh, uh, styles is, is a question that any revision that are that is asked for for someone who is uh, uh, submitting a, a, a paper it, it, see, it is a, a, a new cost of to pay a revision in the in the article, so it becomes very very uh, uh, expensive to, to publish in a, from from the periphery in the in a. So uh, of course 
to, to publish in different languages is one step in, 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 in for, for a journal to try to, to overcome this this barrier. But uh, we, it's not guaranteed that one one paper published in Portuguese or in English in a in a, in a, in a British journal will be read by the the, the own the own community in, in other in other countries. So to try to at least select some some papers to to translate it. It would be a good action to to, to create this, the, the condition to circulate it because it's not it's not easy. Uh, more than this, I think we have the the epistemic and theoretical barriers that, that was that were addressed here also uh, before uh, for from from my colleagues. I think we have some problems uh, which are well from the tradition of science. Uh, the, the, the the existence of sometimes of national schools of thinking so it's different the geography in Brazil is different from geography in uh, in Ecuador or in Peru or in Colombia and uh, these environments are very strong in terms of regulations to, to our practice so so if you try to circulate in the international uh, arenas and uh, you, you must to adapt your what you are producing to to dialogue in your own your own uh, colleague, and of course we have the resistances of the the nationalisms, the epistemic nationalisms that we we must to fight ourselves. So, for example, in in Brazilian geography, we have some geographers who of uh, that uh, think and discusses the the, the the colonial coloniality issues or or try to produce in a in a the colonial perspective, but it's not easy also here. So we, we confront the um, epistemic nationalisms also. Uh, so to try to circulate some, some knowledge which is produced here, to think in, in the dialogues, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking about issues, themes, which are important here, but sometimes they are not from the interest for, for people in, in other countries. Uh, the, the approach, the way that we approach some niche, some, some themes, some, some, some subjects are different from the ways that we, uh, the, this, this, the same issues are approached in different or other, in other contexts. And uh, in also the dialogue with, uh, in terms of the, 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 the theories of the concepts themselves. For example, here in Brazil, we, we, we use territory uh, as a concept to, to, to mean some things that sometimes in uh, the British uh, geography used the terms of the place, for example. So the, this translation, this is not easy, and, but well, is a is a question that we must to think if we are trying to to confront to face this challenge of uh, dis, uh, disseminating uh, knowledge and uh, the the own references. Uh, not only the, uh, we have difference in terms of style. To, to, to make the citations of the references, but also, uh, well, the way that we relate with the references for, are, are very different. It, it implies very strong difference in, in terms of styles of writing. For example, in Brazil, we, we, we uh, rebuild the, the thinking of the authors. We, we, we make citations. This is, this is need here. If you don't know, if you don't, don't, don't make it, you don't publish here. But uh, in, in uh, uh, British uh, journals, for example, this is not used. You just, you just mentioned the author and the, 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 the work and, and the, the idea is, is there. So, so the norms, the rules of knowledge are different from one to other. So I think these, these are some challenges that we must to, to face in this, uh, uh, in this mission or this uh, desire to, to make the, to see how can, how can we simulate actions, stimulate people to not only to publish, which is something that the neoliberalization in, from a peripheral uh, point of view is, is a need that we have from our institutions. Well, we have rules, institutional rules, asking for us publish, publish or perish, publish or perish, publish in, uh, in uh, international journals or, or, or perish. And this is, we have pressure uh, around this. And so, but not only this, uh, but also, well, how can we stimulate? I think to publish in different languages, try to 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 make these translations and uh, and think about these different senses of translation. Well, to 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 take to the, the knowledge produced in one 
uh, environment for, for another. So I think sometimes maybe to, to bring some notes on, on this, well, I think these are challenges that we have to face. And the, the, this is what I, I bring for my first statement here. Thank you. Renato, thank you. Thank you very much for that. I think, again, you bring it, you're, you're, you're coming closer and closer to home for me as the, the work that I do with the journal, um, in which is a perfect transition to introduce Liz Mason Dees, who um, uh, I'll just say that uh, last year in the first issue of 2020, the first issue of JLAG, we launched a new recurring section in the journal where we translate, we commission, we pay for the the, the translation of articles, selected articles that we're already publishing in the journal to publish. Um, either we translate from Portuguese or Spanish into English, or we publish from English into Spanish or Portuguese. And then we make the, the, the Spanish or Portuguese um, version of the article available open access um, to, a, to, to kind of get around the, the problem of the paywall. Um, and Liz, uh, we've been, I've been working with Liz personally uh, for, for now more than a year. She's done the translations, all of the, all of the English translations for us that we've published. Um, Liz has, has done, and I know she does a ton of other translation work. Um, be, and, and not to mention lots of other things. Liz, I don't want to uh, simplify you down to just translating. Um, but I, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our final panelist, Liz mason Dees. So why don't you take the floor, Liz? Thanks, Johnny, for that really nice introduction. Um... And thanks for inviting me. And thanks to all the other panelists. Um, sort of an honor to be here with all of y'all. So I feel like I've learned a lot from all of y'all, not just today, but over the years. Um, so I'm going to get to the, I'm not going to start with the question of translation, but I will get to the question of translation. Um, because as Johnny said, I, I sometimes do other things, but mostly not. I mostly just translate. Um, so, and again, I'm, sort of closing these more as like questions or problems or things I've been thinking about. I don't think, um, I'm certainly not any sort of expert. I don't think any of us would claim to be. And I wanna start with maybe posing that there's of course a lot of decolonial and anti-colonial knowledge that's already being produced in Latin America and elsewhere. And one of the questions we come up with is why isn't that knowledge recognized as such? Um, and it's knowledge that's being produced in um, indigenous and Afro-descendant communities, it's being knowledge being produced by all sorts of social movements, and it's knowledge that isn't generally recognized by um, like academia in general or academic institutions for a whole host of reasons that I'm sure we're all familiar with um, that are political and economic, um, very structural reasons, right? Um, so I think that brings us to look at sort of that academic sphere which includes universities as institutions, as well as the institution of publishing as like one site among sort of these circuits of coloniality, right? And that's something that um, even well, like before I became, even before I became a geographer, I've been like trying to think about um, just in terms of how we understand the university and its role, both in reproducing colonial relationships, but also because of that as a possible site for resisting those, right? And I think um, what Sophia was saying and what various other panelists sort of um, pointed to is like trying to go beyond these binaries where, you know, the South is colonial, the North talks about decoloniality, or the institution is one thing and outside the institution is another thing, but see all the spaces as traversed by both coloniality, obviously, but also resistance, right, um, and anti-colonial action and research. Um, and thinking about that, I also keep coming back to, like, thinking about how we can think about um, these different moments of what we could broadly consider knowledge production. So both, like, the process of research. Um, I know, like, a lot of us on this panel have talked a lot about especially the process of mapping, but research in general also the process of writing, but also think about dissemination of that research and writing as part of this process and how we can think about those, this is more of a question, but how can we think about decolonizing all of those moments of this research um, process and also maybe rethink the relationships between those different moments, right? Um, 
so how can we think about dissemination besides just like something, a final research project that's going to share to the world, but as part of circuits of then producing new knowledge. So I think that's sort of what brings me to think about translation. And in some senses, I mean, to position myself and say, like, I make my living translating, right? Um, which in some ways is a very like, ambiguous role because, I mean, again, various people pointed out that we are right now speaking in English and why are we doing that, right? Is that really necessary? Is that decolonial? Probably not. Um, but also is Spanish any, any less colonial? Again, there's a whole host of questions there. Most of my, um, call it like my day job, right, is translating articles from mostly graduate students in the global south in Latin America who have to publish in academic journals, in English speaking ac academic journals. And I think Renato was getting a really important point. It's not only a question of translating the language, but it's translating the style, right? And like, that's what I bring to my work is like, well, I studied in the US. I know, you know exactly the type of paper they're looking for. And I can you know, provide people with that information. I can tell them, oh, you need to structure your paper this way. You need to have like these sorts of conclusions. You need to cite these people. And like, honestly, that's a job that I really don't think should exist. I mean, like, I'm very happy that I can make some money and like can eat off of doing that, right? But like, why should people have to write that way? I think is, you know, a really important question um, because I think a lot is, a lot ends up getting lost in those translations. It ends up um, homogenizing writing in a way that I don't think is necessary. It's not interesting in many ways, right? I mean, I think like a lot of sort of the more interesting or like creative writing gets lost in that. And I think that's one place that like publishing could be, I mean, I may be very like utopian in this, but I do think that publishing could, could open up to more like creative genres or understandings of like writing or what intellectual production could look like, right? Um, I think that's something that different people on this panel have already like tried to do in different ways. Um, and so just to conclude, I wanted like when I'm thinking about translating, so there's that like ambiguous aspect, but I also in some ways find it very powerful, like most of, not most, but like another side of my, like what I do has been in a lot of translating um, feminist text from Latin America into English, also some vice versa. And there I th we've been with a few comrades been trying to think of like what a feminist practice of translation looks like, which really takes into account the situated nature of all knowledge that we're like translating things both from specific sites, but really from specific struggles, right? Like things that have come out of particular struggles against by specific types of violence in specific territories, but also moving beyond that, how we can really um, connect those. And I think um, this is like the more utopian side that I think that their translation can be really useful in sort of building networks of solidarity in sort of in political terms, right? Like finding things that we have in common and I think um, there's like a lot more that can be done with that if we take sort of that idea of like a feminist translation into account. So I'll just, I'll leave it at that. Liz, thank you very much uh, for that and for your contributions. Um, there are quest questions starting to come in in the Q&A, um, but I do want to very quickly, before we turn to the questions in the Q&A coming in from the audience, I do want to just open the floor one more time to the panelists to see if, if anything that has come up in the last uh, 45 or so minutes um, on the panel, if you, if you want to clarify, to respond, to say anything else before we engage with the audience Q&A. And sorry, I, I realize I said that, like, do you want to clarify? I don't mean that there needs to be clarification. That's not at all what I'm implying. Uh, more, I just want to, to give one more opportunity to our panelists um, to, 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 to get their words in before we open up to the Q&A. Uh, Diana, go, go right ahead. I mean, if you would give me time, then I'll take it. I just, <laughs> I just um, 
I just wanted to use a little bit more time to, because for me, budgeting has become such an important discussion right now. And the other day, uh, I was listening uh, in a presentation that um, Diana Ojeda was uh, having on a paper that she published. And something really caught my attention. She said, uh, when I have to go for field work, I, I need to work with women, right? Um, but these women are also mothers and they have their own activities. They have to do all the current, current reproductive work, right? So how do I do? I cannot take them, and them to, to do any other thing that probably benefits more, more than benefits their, them. So I really need to pay attention on how I can compensate for that labor. So what she was saying is I need to add that in my budget. But the problem then is, so I probably I need to ask somebody else to take care of the children and pay that person, right? But the problem there is on the budgeting, on the official budgeting for my research, for my, uh, for my proposal of uh, the final justification, how do, the issue is how do I formalize that payment? How do I legalize that payment that, that goes into these more the colonial way of thinking of doing research, right? And so I think that for me, it's uh, becoming, as I said, really important to debate uh, on the practice, on the specific practices on the use of budgets and which are really related with, uh, with the methodologies or uh, methods as Sophia was saying. Thank you, um, Sophia, you have- yeah, and, yeah, thank you. Um, just uh, with regards to um, what Liz just, said I was on another panel um, on decoloniality and translation. And I think something that we talked about was uh, moving beyond kind of language barriers, focusing on uh, feminist cartography or, or focus on, on mapping itself as kind of a, a praxis for which we can do decolonial feminisms when, you know, getting rid of kind of lots of language barriers. So it's like as the option of um, you know, and as geographers having that option um, to do so. So I, I guess my, I actually have questions for Liz if that's <laughs> okay. Um, but I don't know, Liz, like what you think about that, you know, does, does really changing the focus again on method, methodology and cartography and feminist, you know, and a lot of the Latin American feminist work on um, mapping femicide or mapping criminalization of abortion, if that, if you think that's like an alternative of doing feminist practice of translation. And then the other is that you know, I've, I've engaged a lot with kind of um, feminists that have been writing a lot on translation politics across the Americas, Sonia Alvarez and others. Um, and I was just wondering, um, again, to listen perhaps to the other panelists, why perhaps we haven't as geographers engaged so much uh, with that literature. You want me to respond quickly? I mean, those are like all really good suggestions. So I don't know how much I really have to say. I, I really like the idea of like using cartography as um, sort of like an actual practice of what we could call translation. I think we like often it gets used in this like metaphoric sense, which is um, nice. So we like actually are cartographers and like we actually do mapping, right? So we could actually use it in a more literal sense, which I think could be really useful. I mean, it's something we're like thinking about now and some of the, um, actually like thinking about how like some of like recent work I've like translated about um, violence and like financialization and this relation to violence work actually um, thinking right now, how could we yeah, could we do mapping workshops across borders that use some of that, um, which I think would be great. Um, I haven't, like, I don't like have like a practice actually proposed, but I really like that idea. And I think, I mean, geography is like such an interesting field, right? That it hasn't engaged a lot of debates um, coming out of, um, you know, how to say this nicely. Um, I mean, we probably all have ideas about why that is, right? Um, and I think there's a lot, a lot to be done there. And I, I'm like hoping, I mean, sort of with the emergence of more feminist geography that maybe some of those conversations will get taken up from, from that angle, I'm really hoping. And um, but I think that's a really good point that it hasn't been yet, right? Thank you. Um, I wanna give just a, a, a moment to see if Hinato or 
Gabriela would like to weigh in, and then we can turn to the questions in the Q and A that are that are turning up. Oh. You 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 reacted to, to my <laughs> to my statement, and that I think well yes I know that that uh, Jay Lag is, is doing some some of these things that I, that I'm I'm saying. Uh, I think the the questions are in the, the order. Uh, uh, the other plan of, of the challenge is translate is not only to put from from one language to another language, but to to make the transit, the traffic of ideas from the environment that where they were built. What what means with the dialogues, with the with the rules, and with the the the, the challenges and uh, and with the struggles that that make made these uh, those ideas re real. To, to another environment, so that, that's the, the question of translation, is when, when some concerns that, that we have in one place are, are not the same concerns that, that you have in another place. I think this, this issue, which is to, to overcome the barriers of this, well, I'm, I'm calling uh, epistemological nationalisms, well, the, the, way, the way that uh, the epistemological communities uh, deal with the with the knowledge, with the tools of knowledge, with the concepts, and uh, making some 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 questions, important questions or not, well, is uh, that's the, the the other the other face of the challenge. And how how can we well uh, to make uh, important some knowledge that are built in one environment to, to another? That's that's the question, and, and I, I don't I don't have the the well, the solutions for that. The, but I think that these are questions that we must concern. If you if you want to to to, to make to change J lag uh, from one a traditional tool as another journal or, uh, or to, to reinforce the dependence and the coloniality of knowledge for, for a tool to to decolonize the the, the knowledge. Yes. Thank you. Um... I think why don't we just we now have several questions popping up in the in the Q and A. So why don't we just take them from the top? Um, I've read through them and and I think they're 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 good questions that are that are really worthy of engaging with. Um, so I'll just I'll read them for those who are listening in or streaming live on YouTube that might not see the the Q and A. Uh, the first question is what what non institutional alternatives can we look at? To counteract the issues that you, that that you all are bringing up, have you ever experienced communities approaching you, or the other way around? Any examples of community research uh, collaborations that you can share? Anyone want to take this? Okay, I can start. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so I think there are ways in which we can think about academic practice as being one mode of engagement. And, and I think I'm speaking from a privileged position to be able to say that because I have an academic job um, and I'm tenured in my job and I can speak about maybe moving between one or another in different moments in time. But what I have found incredibly um, useful and incredibly invigorating is to think about non-productive ways of like doing non-labor and not counting what I do as labor as a way of refusing that category because I think that when we are in an academic institutions we talk about productivity and this is this is one of the anxieties that we've been circling around right um, how you know um, the wage that is associated with a particular kind of labor, even if it involves some kind of labor of love, there's still a wage associated with it because of the need that we have to sustain our lives. We need to eat, we need to take care of others, we need to take care of ourselves. Um, and so one of the things that I have been doing is I hold non-labor sessions uh, with people that I typically um, have worked with in, in Ecuador, for example, um, or, or with my students or with my collaborators where we count, we don't count it as a 
formalized form of labor. And, um, and that becomes a space where we're, we don't have to talk about productivity, but we talk about the other things that are fulfilling in our lives. And it is difficult because we know each other in this other context of work, um, but it is necessary to, to represent that space and to, and to in, encourage that space. Um, and so one of the things that I've done during these COVID times is um, I, um, I organized with some of my collaborators in Esmeraldas and in Quito to, to, to track our, our redes, our redes of, of solidarity with our neighbors, with our partners, with our families, and to craft that and recognize that as what sustains us. So we are not publishing that. Um, we, I, I have been very careful about trying to make that productive work, but I've been, I've been keeping in touch with that as a way to continue feeling connected without having to account it as a form of economic value or productivity or publication. And that is hard because our worth as academics is sort of associated with that metric, right? Is it published? Is it new? Is it different? What are you contributing? And um, so we've been actually working on not doing that, but it, um, but it doesn't pay, right? And so that there's that there's that tension there between what is an, putting an economic value on it or not. Um, so that's a form of non-institutionalized or refusal through which we have been working um, in relation to to knowledge production and decolonizing our own practices. Go ahead, Sophia. Thank sure. you. Um, I think uh, seeing that question and others below it as well, um, that Diana and I are part of the Critical Geography Collective of Ecuador, which is a completely autonomous, non-institutional uh, uh, collective of geographers and non-geographers that have been doing uh, counter cartography and critical geography work uh, since 2012. So that, you know, that that is, and, and, and like I see in the comments, Hill Brujas as well as another collective, there are many collectives like this in Latin America. Um, and it's a, it's very important, I think, um, to have these spaces because they are non institutional, because they are completely autonomous. Um, they give a lot of breathing room, they give a lot of um, you know, they, they're very permissive of a lot of decolonial uh, praxis. I wouldn't say that they're all decolonial and I don't think many would even identify as decolonial. Though, having said that, I do think that uh, Emanuela Simano, who's also, who, come, who made a comment, who's also part of the Critical Geography the co uh, Collective on collective authorship, I do think uh, that's one of the benefits of uh, an autonomous space of, uh, you know, collective, uh, critical geography spaces that you can produce, you know, other types of publication manuals, guias uh, that, that are available um, and open source. And just one last, um, I think, experience that, that Liz also came to Ecuador and she was part of, um, we organized in 2019, a gathering of critical geography autonomous collectives. Um, and it was right pre-EGAL, which is like the AAG equivalent in the US, but pre the, the Latin American Conference of Critical Geography. And we did it on purpose as a way to say, you know, this is this is critical ge geography, this is autonomous, non-institutional forms of doing critical geography. So there's, you know, there's many of these things that are that are underway, um, but I think that uh, they have different forms of being visibilized. So I, I don't know if these are, you know, these initiatives aren't if you're not kind of connected to certain circles, you probably won't know about them. So perhaps that's also something that we can be critical of. I don't know, Diana, if you have something more to say regarding our, our collective. <laughs> Renato, did you want to weigh in on that? Yes, I think by strengthening this, this dialogue with Sophia, the Sophia example, though, I think well, one, this, the, the cartography, the cartographies, uh, a very very good example of this. Well, I, um, I was I researched also the new cartographies, uh, new practices in the in the field of cartography, and uh, 
Well, I think this brings us good examples to think about this challenge. Well, I'm, I name this uh, cartographical activisms, and uh, which uh, is a notion which comp try to comprehend different ways uh, in which these groups are are acting in the field of cartography. Uh, one one th one one thing, one action is the the production of of maps. In, in, inside the groups, with the groups. Well, um, cartography is not only geographers, but also other groups, other professionals, uh, architectures, hackers, and others, well, uh, join the, the social groups uh, in creating mass. But, but not only this, and this is the, the important role. We have the production of cartographies, well, link it to the, the cultural uh, raised in, in the cultural reference of the groups, and in, in, in these terms, they are they are challenging, they are facing, uh, uh, they are making a struggle against the cartographical conventions. So they are they, they are they are trying to to to, to struggle for the, the norms, the rules of the of the, the knowledge production, creating maps that subverts the, the, the norms of the traditional norms of the traditional and imperial cartography. So uh, uh, the cartographical activism, cartographical activism is not only to produce maps, but also to, to fight the rules, the traditional rules in the form of, of space representations, but uh, and also to create tools uh, to, to face, the, to, to confront the tools that are, are being created by the, the big economic groups like Google, for example, uh, which is the most popular tool for, for produce mapping now, which is being appropriated by social groups here, here in Brazil. Now, now, now I'm looking for the, 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 the appropriation of these tools by groups in the, con in the pandemic context, for example. We see, for example, uh, Marielle Franco Institute uh, uh, using the, the Google Maps to, to, to make a map of social activism in the, uh, at the same time that Google uh, refused to give the, the, the data ab about the, the murders of my Marielle Franco. And so we are uh, reinforcing, but the other, the other way we have cartographical activists uh, uh, creating open street map, mathematics, trying to, to struggle this, uh, the tools of knowledge production. And uh, not only in technological terms, but also in in social terms, uh, when, when we conceive the production of knowledge as a, a, a social process of power, well, uh, what's the power to decide what is represented, how it is represented? Well, we have experience where this is shared. The power of defining what is the social representative is shared with, with the group. So we have the, the, the meaning of participative cartography is one thing which is being well, uh, confronted by different experience. So I think this brings us examples of what we can do if we want to, to decolonize knowledge. That it's not only to produce a knowledge, well, uh, turn it to, to subaltern groups. For example, I discuss race issues, and so uh, we have uh, experience of uh, groups, black, black movements, groups here, uh, uh, appropriating the, the tools, making maps, of, uh, of the racial uh, racism, uh, the religious racism, for example, uh, mapping the, the, the groups, ma mapping the, the, the events of violence uh, in these terms, but also well, we have groups trying to confront the way that we learn cartography in the school, which just le give legitimacy to, to some kinds of representations and not to another kinds of representations. I think for, for a, 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 a publish, uh, a, a journal. I think we, we, we must think about these discussions and how how can we spread these discussions about not only to make circulate the some some knowledge but also to to make circulate the the the, the struggle around the, the the rules of knowledge production. Uh, this I think is 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 the the key point in this discussion. Can I say something real quick? Oh, absolutely. Um, Go right ahead, Liz. I think mean, it's really fascinating that so many of us are doing this sort of like counter critical cartography work like in here. Um, and I think that is like an important, a really important part of like what like a decolonial anti 
um, colonial geography might have to offer, right? Um, and um, just to say that when I went to Ecuador with Sofia and Diana, that was a really great experience. And it was like really great to learn about how many other collectives in Latin America are doing this type of work. And I mean, that was one of the things I was like trying to say at the beginning, there is all of this really interesting like anti-colonial work that's happening. And for different reasons, it's like not read as academic or intellectual production. And some of that's because people don't want it to be, right? Which is like super valid. Um, they don't want to be like captured by that system, which I think is very valid. And in other ways, it's because it's like very hard for these institutions to recognize collective work in general. Um, like I've been part of the kind of cartographies collective in the US and I think, um, and we've you know, ran into all sorts of problems trying to do that sort of collective work within the US neoliberal university. And so like, I really liked what you were saying, Gabby, but I also think like, if you look at the people in three C's, there are like seven of us and only one of us has tenure. Um, and most of the rest of us don't work in the academy anymore. And I think just like those, like those very material conditions make it very hard in the US especially, but also, I mean, the neoliberal universities everywhere, right? To do that kind of collective work, which I think, um, I mean, I don't have a solution to that, but I think it's something that's worth taking seriously. Um, yeah. I want to. I want to. We we we're we're growing short on time, and there are lots of really really, I think, important questions in the in the Q and A. So if if we can turn to Charlene's question uh, about uh, absences within this discussion, and how a a decolonial lens might help kind of shine a light on some of the absences within our own institutions. She speaks of her institution in Canada um, where racist and colonial experiences in Canada itself um, impact uh, both students and faculty uh, and researchers. And so I, I, I don't wanna read the whole question. It's a long question. It's a really important question. I think we've all had a chance to see it there. And I wanna see if anybody wants to address that question in particular. Okay, I'll go again. <laughs> um, and I think this builds on what Liz was saying as well. Um, and I think, I mean, I'm not speaking for all, but definitely I do think that those of us who does do have a certain stability in our employment, we are benefiting from the system through which other people don't. And so I do see it as in my personal case, it's a responsibility that when I have collaborators who are not able to gain the same kind of economic, have the same kind of economic gain, I, I make sure that I can support them. And that's, that can end up being a very individualized decision. And that is also part of the kind of structural habit of colonial, colonialist thought that we need to unpack. Um, what I do is not very popular among people that I know, but nonetheless, I do feel the commitment that if I am benefiting from this, then I should be, I should be responsible for those who I collaborate with and with whom I am building together and those who are participating in the research that I do and those who are affected by that research should be able and I and I am committed to um, to contribute to them as well. So that's I can't generalize that and I don't think a decolonial practice is also an abstraction that we can generalize that as a rule, but it's certainly something that we need to feel um, that we're responsible for. We have some of we have obligations from a system that we benefit from. Yeah, Diana, go right ahead. Yeah, thank you, Charlene, for your question. Really very challenging. I really don't know how to answer precisely. Uh, it's a very difficult question. Me, myself, having done my PhD in Canada, I know maybe that maybe some, some experiences have related uh, to you. Um, but I think when I, I relate to my own experience at what I, I saw in Ecuador, but I, I definitely think uh, they do happen everywhere. So I, I is, I wouldn't say it's a matter of comparing where is, who is less fortunate or not, but it's uh, calling out this, this is a structural problem and it's happening everywhere. It's happening in, in Norway, right? In, I'm living in a country that is supposed to be super proud on, in all of this 
socialist uh, principles, right? But it's happening because this is a constant process of pushing for more neoliberalization of the academia. And that at the same time, it's uh, having like serious daily consequences on the daily life, especially on the ones that are more vulnerable than that. Liz was talking about is the ones on temporal positions, the ones that are still the students, that even if they they view to speak up, I mean, there are consequences, right? So I don't know exactly how we can do, but I do believe that we really need to speak up, especially having support from more, like from tenure uh, members of faculty is really important because at the same time there's, there's coming and it's becoming quite uh, popular now this approach of we need to engage in this uh, hot conversation which is decolonizing academia right and and for that what they do is hire um, um, people from the south people of color and that only becomes a talking of who are we really talking about decolonizing right are we just like uh, um, doing some makeup on the really deeply structural problems that are happening in academia. Thank you, Liana, for that. Um, so there's there's been several questions in the chat that kind of and, and, and it's come up in the in the discussion thus far about the kind of the politics of citation on the one hand, um, and we and we the JLAG. Uh, editorial team has written about this in introducing our translation, our our JLAG introduction section, in talking about the, the the politics of translation that kind of privileges not only anglophone literature but also like kind of the big names. You cite, you know, I think somebody in this conversation already said you have to cite the right people. Hanato, I think you mentioned you have to cite the right people, um, and it's almost always north-based scholars, almost always writing in English. Um, and so on the one hand, we have the kind of politics of citation. And then on the other hand, we have a question from Emiliano, who asks a, a, a sincere question about like, how do you find what search engines, how, like, how do you go about the business of finding the literature that's not the top cited literature by the Anglophone, prob uh, Anglophone uh, geographers and scholars publishing in the big journals uh, based in North America and Europe. Like what are the tactics, he asked, what are the tactics you can think of for us in the Anglophone context to be able to find our colleagues in Latin America? So I wonder if any of you wanna weigh in on, on that question um, in, in terms of kind of an individual practice of disrupting this politics of uh, citation. Uh, Sophia, go right ahead. Yeah, I think a couple of things. I think um, it's, it's good to follow collectives, like so all the critical geography collectives in Latin America, follow them. All of us are on social media, so follow our work there. And you're right, I never use search, like academic search engines for that literature. I just would never do that. Um, but it, it, um, it just, yeah, they don't mix. So I think um, that's one way. Uh, the other, there's tons of webinars right now um, that are, you know, that are great ways of getting to know a lot of the literature that's being produced in collectors, but also uh, emerging scholars in the region. So that's what I would say now is follow collectives in the, in the, in social media, but also listen on, on webinars. Go ahead, Renato. I was trying to, to read the, all the questions that we have in the Q and A, but there are there's so much questions. Well, I just just wanted to, to to raise some some small points. Not this is a really small. But uh, my my point of view in this discussion, uh, which I think is about our relation, the, the relation between the the academic uh, work and the the university. And uh, uh, and the, the social groups who are fighting for and who needs the decolonization in their in their living our relations. Well, well, my position is a little bit different because well, before I uh, I become a, a, a teacher at university, I was activist in the in the social group. So, in, in, as a black scholar. In, in one moment that Brazil is discussing affirmative action, for example, we have now affirmative action. In my in my own institution, I have affirmative action. So I have black black students there, black students who are activists in different different places. Well, this 
this border uh, between uh, the academic work and the, the social group uh, in the in the social movement is is not exactly a, 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 a strong board, so a strong border. So, well, what 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 I think is important is to, to think what are the tools that geography or uh, to, to to what what the production of knowledge from a, 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 from a, a space thinking can can help these groups. Well, not only to reflect about the groups, but also to give tools to the to the, the groups struggle. Not and not only to, to to produce maps the groups to the, the daily lives the groups. So that's very important. But how how the the uh, how can we, for example, think about well uh, politics of of scale of the, the groups, for example, how the groups can can well access different arenas for. And so I think well to to, to decolonize knowledge is also. To, to think about the, the plural possibilities that the, the geography knowledge can and have to the to the to the, to the groups. I don't know if I'm, I'm answering the, the right question, but uh, thank you, thank you. I think unfortunately our time is really limited. There's so many great questions and so many great uh, kind of ideas and a really uh, I think important discussion happening here. I do want to skip. To the, to the last question that was just posted a few minutes ago, um, because I think this gets kind of at the heart of a lot of, of what we've been talking about um, from Eloisa. Uh, she, she asks, I'm wondering about the longstanding question of translation and abstraction of social realities, um, relations, epistemologies, ontologies into academic language and theory. How do you, so it's a, a, a twist on translation, right? How do you envision a decolonial approach to this process? How to account for the incommensurabilities, or, or or would the option be to aim for a more accurate translation to opt for refusing ethnographic translation? Uh, and I, I I think this is this is a this is an intriguing question, um, and I'd love to hear all all of your your takes on it. Though it's got to be in 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 you know in twenty second sound bites. So um, I don't know who wants to go first on this. Um, and this might and, and let me just say this might be the last question that we can answer. So thanks to everyone. My apologies that we didn't get to all the questions here. Um, but uh, but who wants to take this question first? Maybe I'll go really quickly. Sure, sure. I think I mean this is an amazing question, very complicated. But I think. Uh, on trying to translate these ideas were limited by language itself. So I guess another way of thinking that we'll see how other ways of expressing all of these thoughts, ontologies and epistemologies we have to besides only writing, but I'll just say. Yeah, I'll say something quickly too. Also, hi, Louisa. Um, I think like Sophia's like proposal of maybe like translating through cartography is like one way of getting at this um, or also maybe, yeah, cause I, I mean, language is obviously super limiting, uh, maybe like translating through art or like other things. And I also think there's room for maybe like some translations are gonna make like, there's like a discomfort in translation and maybe, you know, like some words I often leave in Spanish or some words, um, you know, like can't be translated and that's okay. And like, it's okay for that to like, make us uncomfortable. Any, any final thoughts from our panelists? Can, can, oh, can we hear from Sophia? Sophia, Sophia, Sophia yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just want to thank Eloisa for that wonderful question. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I, I've written on the on decolonial translocation and the epistemología de la transloca and all the possibilities that can come from never fitting in place for this. So I, I think um, I've, I've said enough about that in other places, but I love your question about the refusal of ethnographic translation, because I, I think that's a take on, on ethnographic refusal, which has been so important in other discussions. So right back at you, Lisa, I think that's, that's a wonderful question. Renato, go right ahead. Thank you, Louisa, for this question. I think it's, it's, very, it's very important. Well, I think well, the, 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 what we can do is to use the tools that available for us. So when, when, when we read a, a, a translated book, for example, or a translated paper, so sometimes the translator puts a note explaining something comes from another context, another so social 
or uh, epistemological con political context. So I think w one one thing that the that the journals can do is maybe well when you identify a very interesting paper or a, 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 a work. Oh, it's, it's inter interesting to translate this, but well, it was produced in a different context. Maybe to, to bring some comments on this. Well, uh, and uh, but, but I'm talking about to, to, to call some comments, people to, to comment this and to, to make this appointment about the, the difference of the, the context. Well, I think maybe it's, it's what we can do to make the, the idea circulate uh, uh, respecting the, the, the original sense that they were built. Yes. Thank you, and thank you again for this opportunity to join you. It was wonderful. Yeah, I want to just express my my sincere gratitude to the panelists here tonight, um, participating in this, this, I think, really important discussion. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone who was here in attendance. Um, and I want to, before we, we bid adieu, I do want to uh, kick it back to, to Jim Biles, who's going to talk a little bit about um, what, what's coming next in this series. Thank you very much, Johnny, uh, and thank you to the panelists for this very engaging uh, and informative uh, discussion. So we have one remaining live CLAG session uh, in two weeks on April 14th. So I hope to see many of you at that session. Uh, it is titled Roads in Amazonia, Perspectives from the Brazilian and Peruvian Borderlands. And um, that webinar is being organized by our colleague, David Salisbury. Also uh, at the end of our final lag, live CLAG session, uh, we are going to be having a reception and we're going to invite all of our panelists here today and at all eight of our um, live CLAG webinars, uh, the CLAG membership, friends of CLAG, those who have been in attendance at these events. Um, and we hope to see you there. We're going to have a number of breakout rooms so that people can gather in small groups and chat and converse and gossip and do all the good things that we do at sort of traditional conferences which unfortunately this year we will not be able to have. Uh, again, I want to thank everybody uh, for their participation in this event. I wanna thank those of you in attendance and I hope to see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you very much and good night to everybody. Bye.